through. But today, as we wrap up the series, we're just going to focus on the last two verses. And I want us to see our relationship to the Holy Spirit of God. Our relationship to the Holy Spirit of God. And the point of all this in this chapter is that our relationship to Christ is not isolated. It impacts all of the believer's life. In other words, you cannot have a relationship to Christ without having it with the church, without having a unique one with the world, and we see today our relationship to the Holy Spirit, the, the, one of the persons of the Godhead. So here's what I want to say to you in the onset. We've talked about being united to Christ. You can't be united to Jesus Christ unless you have a relationship with the Holy Spirit. We've talked about our relationship to one another, the church. You cannot possibly forgive and love and rejoice and live life with other Christians unless you have the Holy Spirit of God. We've talked about our relationship to the world. You cannot endure persecution and suffering. You cannot go through those things well without the Holy Spirit of God. So this is the night before Jesus dies. He has just given the Lord's Supper in the upper room. He has warned them that the world will hate you, and it hated me first. And they surely thought after hearing those somber words, was following Jesus these last three years a waste of time? Did I just do all of this, and now all he's promising me is hatred and opposition? We're just a little flock. There's only 11 of us left. Judas has walked out of the room. How can this little flock face a great multitude? How can we do this? Well, the point of this is the disciples will not face the world alone. We don't go through this life alone. If we're united to Christ and we're united to Christ's people, no matter what the world does, with the power of the Holy Spirit's help, we will overcome. So hear with me God's Word, John 15. Let's look at these last two verses together. When the Helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, He will testify of me, and you also will bear witness, because you have been with me from the beginning. Let's read it one more time. It's a short section. But when the Helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, He will testify of me, and you will also bear witness, because you have been with me from the beginning. This is the word of the Lord. A new source of consolation and encouragement and help now arrives in these last two verses at the end of this section of Jesus teaching to his disciples. Now, the word here that we have in the New King James Version is the word helper. The helper is going to come. But this is translated different ways. In the Old King James, it was rendered comforter. In the New International Version, it's advocate. We see other translations like counselor or friend. There's a lot of different ways to render this word here that is speaking of the Holy Spirit. Now, Jesus has mentioned the Holy Spirit two times so far in this gospel, in our studies through this book. But now he's going to begin to begin uh, just unpacking for us a new dimension of our unity, our community with God, the Holy Spirit. Now, the word here, comforter or helper or advocate, is the Greek word parakletos. Now, I don't expect any of you to remember that when you walk out the doors, but I want to break it down for you for a minute. Two words. It's a compound word, para and kaleo. Para means to come alongside somebody. So if you see someone in need, someone needing encouragement, someone needing strength, you walk over and you literally come by their side. Para. Kaleo is simply the Greek word to call out to someone, to speak to someone or for someone. So the Greek word here means one who is called to another side to aid them or to help them. In fact, this word was used in the ancient Greek language to talk about someone who is a legal assistant, almost like a lawyer today, someone who would plead another person's cause. So if you're standing before a judge or you're standing before an enemy or you're standing in a precarious position and you're alone and feeling lost and all of a sudden someone comes alongside of you to hold your arms up, to help you lift your chin up, 
to put their hand on your side as an encouragement, maybe even to speak on your behalf and be there for you in your moment of weakness and confusion and pain. That is what we're talking about here. So the world is going to hate you. There's going to be opposition. The Christian life is not always a bed of roses. If you've uh, never trusted in Christ, maybe you've walked into the doors of this church and any church for the first time today, understand that when we say we're Christians, that doesn't mean we have it all together. It doesn't mean that our lives do not have suffering or sickness or struggles or hardships at all. That is not Christianity as the Bible pictures it. That is not true Christianity. You see, when we look at God's Word and we think about these things, Jesus is actually promising us in this chapter that the world will be hard and it's going to be tough as a follower of Christ. And it's not the fact that we don't have troubles. The difference is who is with us in our troubles. It's not that we don't have troubles. It's that we're not going through them alone. He gives us a community and most importantly, He's there with us. And the way He's with us is with this comforter we read about here, the Holy Spirit. I remember back about 14 years ago, I was uh, subpoenaed, essentially, to go before a, a federal group. I'm not going to get into all the details of it. I was not in trouble, thank the Lord, but someone else was. And I was asked to come and speak before this group, and so... Um, it was kind of nerve-wracking. 14 years ago, it was a while back. I had never been called into court or any kind of situation like that before. And I knew that other people's lives really depended on what I would say and how I would speak in that meeting. And of course, I only wanted the best for anybody in the situation. And I remember getting into that room, and um, I was all alone, being kind of interrogated, asked these questions by uh, I felt like I was with the men in black, you know, they, the only thing missing were the glasses, but they were very sober and somber asking these questions. And I was just starting and I was quite nervous because uh, the people I was speaking about, I really cared for. And all of a sudden, there was a knock on the door and came walking in the room, someone who's in this room today, a, a lawyer, and um, who's a Christian and who loves Christ. And uh, he came to sit there next to me and encourage me and to help me with my answers and to make sure um, that I wasn't taken advantage of. And I'm telling you, I went from the bottom of the pit to cloud nine in about three seconds when that man walked in the door. Because I wasn't alone anymore. Because I had guidance. I had support. I had someone there for me. And I want to say to you today, that is exactly what we're talking about here. It's like the world's coming against you. Your world is crumbling down and all of a sudden, your spirits are lifted up, your weak arms are lifted up, and strength is renewed, because now this comforter is here to give you courage at the time of trial. We read a ton of promises in the Bible about God being with us, about God not failing us. Let me show you a few of them on the screen. We have passages like Joshua 1.9 where it says, Be strong and courageous, don't be afraid. Don't be dismayed. That means your soul is just feeling lost and overwhelmed. Why? Because the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Now, the question you have to ask is, how is God with me wherever I go? Jesus is at the right hand of God in heaven right now. Well, the reason why God can make this promise is because there is a comforter, God the Holy Spirit. That's how God's with us. Isaiah 41, fear not, for I'm with you. Don't be dismayed. I'm your God. I will strengthen you and help you. And then notice he says, I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. The world might have hands against you, but the Holy Spirit is there holding you and keeping you safe. How about this one? Isaiah 43, fear not. Why? When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they will not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flame will not consume you because I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. You see, all these promises about God not failing us and never leaving us, that is all fulfilled in the Comforter, in the Holy Spirit. He is with us. He is God's presence here on this earth. In fact, the New Covenant in Ezekiel 36, we read there that God is going to 
do this great work in your heart. So what it means to be a Christian, it doesn't mean just simply to, to pray a prayer to Jesus or to even really ask Jesus into your heart. It's not exactly what it means to be a Christian. I know we use that nomenclature, those terms a lot. You hear that on Christian television a lot. But the, the way the Bible actually pictures it, it's like our hearts are dead in sin. They're not alive. They're not beating. We're not talking about a physical heart. We're talking about your spiritual person. And God reaches in and he gives you a full heart transplant. See, we don't just give God like, like let Jesus enter into about 10% of your heart, but you can keep the other 90 or you can flip it around 90, 10, whatever percentages. No, he says, I'm going to give you a brand new heart. It's going to be alive, a heart of flesh. And I am going to put my spirit within you. In other words, God's going to be with you. He's not going to leave you. He's not going to forsake you. He's not going to fail you no matter what you're going through. No matter how many people are angry at you, not, no matter how many bows are pulled back and arrows are pointed at you, no matter how much hostility you're feeling and how lost you are, you're not lost if you've been found by Christ. He's with you and His Spirit is there. So, John 15 in these two verses, he says, when the helper comes, whom I will send from the Father. He's going to come. There's going to be a point of time. This is in the aorist tense. A point of time when this comforter, the Holy Spirit, comes. Jesus said in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, one of the last words to his disciples before he ascended into heaven. He said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. In other words, there's a definitive time when the Holy Spirit comes into a person's life. A definitive time. Now, God in heaven has chosen to send His Son Jesus into this world. Jesus, when He's in this world, is saying, I am going to send you the Comforter. God is going to send you the Comforter, the Holy Spirit. Now, this happened very dramatically. If you've read the book of Acts before in chapter 2, we call that Pentecost. We are told there that very visibly and dramatically, the Holy Spirit came on those first Christians, and there was even cloven tongues of fire upon them. Now, that was a one-time event, and that's never been repeated again. But I want you to understand that the Holy Spirit comes invisibly into our hearts when we trust in Christ. When we get the new heart and God does this work of changing us from the inside out, the Holy Spirit comes to live in us. The influence of His love and His light and His grace flood our hearts. And He's called here the Spirit of Truth. You see, this world today really has a truth problem, don't they? We don't know what's true anymore. Truth is relative to the current world. It's relative to your generation for my generation, that was truth, but for your generation, you know, things, times have changed. We have to get with the program. Truth is relative to your feelings. If it feels good, it's good, do it. Truth is relative to the majority, right? The demos, the democracy. So as long as the majority thinks it's okay, it must be right. That worked real well. You know, like in the 1860s when there was slavery, right? The majority said it was okay. It works really well today, as the majority says it's okay to take the life of children in the womb, right? If the majority says it's okay, it must be true. No, that is not the case at all, is it? One person with God is the majority. You see, all truth comes from God, because all truth is God's truth. God is the standard of truth, and the Holy Spirit, the comforter here, is called the Spirit of truth. You don't know what to say. You don't know what to answer. You don't have an answer to their questions. Guess who does? The Spirit of truth has the answer. You don't have to get creative and make something up. God's Word has the answer. When we read this here in the Spirit of truth, what this is saying in here is our faith is not the subject of the opinions of men. If it was, Christianity would come and go and come and go. It would be overwhelmed a thousand times. Our faith is based on truth. You see, this single witness of truth will drive away and scatter the sinful condition of our hearts. It'll help us to see who we really are, but also to see who God really is and what the cross is really all about. In John chapter 16, verses 8 and 9, in the next chapter, Jesus is going to go even more. He's going to say, when He comes, 
He will convict the world of three things. First off, of our sin. In other words, most of us think we're pretty good people. Most of us think we don't have a sin problem. We read the newspaper and say, I'm not like, those, or I should say we scroll our phones and say, I'm glad we're not like those kind of people, right? We read about all these bad people and we say, I'm glad I'm not like them. And when you've made that statement, you've just sinned. Because you've, you've done the sin of pride. You've thought you're better than someone else, right? But we all have a sin problem. And then secondly, of righteousness. Now, that's a big Bible word, a theology word, righteousness. Well, what does he mean here? He's talking about himself. You see, the world said that Jesus was not righteous. The world accused him in a kangaroo court. The world lied about Jesus. Even the witnesses who spoke against Jesus contradicted one another. And then <clears throat> the man Judas, who was the betrayer of Judas, Jesus, who had lived with Jesus for three years, he got so convicted, he came back and he threw the 30 pieces of silver down and he said, my hands have betrayed an innocent man. Even he could not find a sin against Jesus. But today, the world hates him. The world is opposition to Jesus' word, to Jesus' love, to Jesus' law, to Jesus' cross. They can't even stand seeing it in a public place. They want to tear him down because it's so offensive to them. But the Holy Spirit helps us to see we are sinners and help us to see that we don't live a perfect life, but Jesus was righteous and he lived a perfect life for everyone in this room. And then also judgment. In other words, this world is not the only world that we have. You see, the world hates Jesus. That's what we read last week. And the world, the people of the world, only think about this world, not the world to come. But when the Holy Spirit begins to work on our hearts, He begins to tell us that there is a world to come. You students here, today I know you have your whole lives ahead of you, right? But you can't wait and say, I will get right with God one day. There is an eternity to come, and we don't know that day, right? But when God calls us, we will face Him in judgment. And He goes on to say, they're gonna, the Holy Spirit's going to convict them of sin because they don't believe in Me. They don't believe in Me. And that's exactly what the Holy Spirit does. I read a story this week about a park ranger at Yellowstone National Park. And he was leading a group of hikers to a fire lookout to check the scene out. And the ranger was so intent on telling the hikers about the flowers and the animals that all these messages that were coming through on his two-way radio were getting kind of annoying because he had this really interactive group and he was enjoying talking to them. And so this ranger broke protocol and he switched off his radio. Now, as the group neared the tower, the ranger was met by a nearly breathless lookout, this lookout who came uh, running to him. And the lookout was kind of freaking out and saying, why haven't you answered your radio? A grizzly bear was spotted from the tower stalking your group. And the authorities were trying to warn you of the danger. You see, when we tune out the Holy Spirit, when we resist the Word of God and the Holy Spirit, we are putting ourselves and those around us in great danger. When we don't take sin seriously, and we don't take Jesus' righteousness seriously. And we don't take seriously the fact that one day we will give an account for every word we speak and every action that we commit. We are putting ourselves in danger. Students, every word you speak to your parents, to your fellow students, to your classmates, every word you speak when your parents are not listening, we'll give an account for as parents in the room, every word we speak behind closed doors to our spouses. Or we don't speak in front of our children, but we speak on social media. Or we speak at the workplace, because we can be a different person at work than we can be at home or at church on Sunday morning. Every word we will give an account for. Every single word. And so we are putting our souls in danger and those around us in danger when we do this. Now notice that the Holy Spirit proceeds from beside the Father. He is spoken of as a distinct person. He is distinguished here from the Father. He is distinguished here from Jesus. This is the mystery of the Trinity. There's one God, three persons. 
The Holy Spirit is not an it. He is not a ghost. I know the old translation said Holy Ghost, but he's not a ghost. All right? It's not related to Casper or something like that. He is a person. He proceeds from the Father. He will testify of me. In other words, he was with God from eternity because he is God. The Holy Spirit didn't come into existence 2,000 years ago at Pentecost. He is eternal God. In the beginning at the creation of the world, when God spoke the world into the existence and God said, let there be light and there was light, we are told the Spirit of God was there moving upon the face of the waters, taking all of the matter of the cosmos and preparing it for life and for beauty and for grandeur. Holy Spirit's God. He's been from the beginning, eternally God. He is the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is to be worshipped and glorified, as the Nicene Creed says. A Christianity that leaves the Holy Spirit out, that gives Him no place at all, is no Christianity at all. The Holy Spirit should not be buried in our faith. He is God. And He is integral to living the Christian life, as we're about to see. See, some people say the Holy Spirit is just an a influence or an inward feeling. Many Christians uh, make the Holy Spirit kind of like the force in Star Wars, just this kind of cosmic energy that flows around the, the world. Please listen to me. The Holy Spirit is not a force. He is Almighty God. Some people say that there's different modes of God, that in the Old Testament we had God the Father, in the Gospels we have God the Son, and now we have God the Spirit. Notice Jesus here speaks about the Holy Spirit as a person who's next to God in heaven and as a person who is going to come down and rule and reign in our hearts. He's going to work in our hearts. He will bear witness of me. He will testify of me. In other words, when I'm talking to someone else about Jesus. The Holy Spirit is silently and invisibly working through the words that I'm speaking. When I feel like losing it on someone else, but all of a sudden self-control kicks in and I feel convicted of my anger and my temper and my brokenness, the Holy Spirit is working inside of me. It's not simply my conscience. The Holy Spirit is not our conscience. He is a person alive with us. See, everything the Holy Spirit does here is consistent with the testimony and nature of Jesus. His job is to tell us, to show us who Jesus is, and to help us to live like Christ, like a Christian. So, the primary ministry of the church and the Holy Spirit, listen to this, is not political activism. It's not to get somebody in the White House. It is not social reform. I'm all about justice and about a, so, you know, having social justice, if you will. But I would prefer to say we need to gospelize the social. We need to be Christians who are making a difference about injustice. It is not primarily psychology or self-fulfillment or pragmatic ways to just pack the church out. No, His job and our job is to lift up Jesus Christ. He will testify of me, Jesus says. This is what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 2, verse 2. I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I want to read to you some hard words. If you've been in the church long, you'll understand these words. If you're not a Christian and you're here today, um, you've probably turned on Christian television, maybe flipping through at some point, and you've seen people doing some bizarre things, people rolling around on the ground or falling over on the ground or... Um, you know, kind of babbling in uh, tongues that are not languages. You've seen these kind of things. And I want to read you a quote from one writer. The real Holy Spirit is not an electrifying current of ecstatic energy. He is not a mind-numbling babbler of irrational speech. He is not a cosmic genie who indiscriminately grants self-centered wishes for health and wealth. The true Spirit of God does not cause His people to bark like dogs. I know it sounds weird, but there's stuff on TV that looks just like this, and it claims to be Christian. It does not cause His people to laugh like hyenas. 
You can laugh at that if you need to. It's weird. He does not accomplish his kingdom work through false prophets, through fake healers, or through fraudulent televangelists. It is a sad twist of irony that those who claim to be most focused on the Holy Spirit are in actuality the ones doing the most to abuse, grieve, insult, misrepresent, quench, and dishonor Him. Just because it's called Christian doesn't mean it is Christian. Jesus says here, the Holy Spirit will bear witness. He will testify of me. That is his number one job in our hearts, to help us live like Jesus, speak for Jesus, act like Jesus. Hear the words of J.I. Packer. Packer said, the Spirit's message is never, look at me, listen to me, come to me, get to know me. Nor is it, come to the church, listen to the church, look at the church. It is always, look at Jesus, see Jesus' glory, listen to Jesus, hear Jesus' word, go to Jesus and have life, get to know Jesus and taste His gift of joy and peace. That's what the Holy Spirit does. He helps us in this. By His power and in His influence and His success, He changes the hardest and darkest of hearts and He helps us in the hardest of days. So, What does this look like? Let's get real practical now. If we'll go to the next slide, get real practical for a minute. In John 15, we've looked at a lot of different passages. You can go to that next one. A lot of different passages so far. What are the things that the Holy Spirit does inside of us? First off, He helps us find joy. We saw Jesus say, you're going to bear fruit and you're going to have joy in it. In other words, if I'm trying to live the Christian life on my own, in my own strength, day by day, I'm going to fall flat on my face. I'm going to get tired. I'm going to be weary. I'm going to give up. But if I live every day dependent on God, the Holy Spirit, I'm going to have joy in serving Him. It's not enough to serve God. We're called to serve the Lord with joy, with gladness. If there is no joy in your Christianity, there is a leak somewhere in it. There is a leak. He's going to help us to find joy. I mean, that's one of the fruit of the Spirit, right? Love, joy. Secondly, He's going to help us to love one another as Jesus loves. That's what Jesus taught us, right? If we're united to Christ, we're united in communion. If we have union with Him, we have communion with one another. And that means we will love one another as Jesus loves. So how do we do that? It's impossible on our own. It's impossible to forgive an enemy on your own. It's impossible to forgive someone who's done you wrong on your own. But if you are full of the Holy Spirit, you will be a person of forgiveness. You're not going to live in the past and talk about the past and bear grudges against others. If you're doing that, you need to question whether you're saved. Because we are to be a people of forgiveness. Jesus said in Matthew 6, If you do not forgive, your sins are not forgiven. Very simple and clear. Helps us love our enemies. I mean, that's what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount. Right? Love one another. How about love your enemies? Start there. Serving one another. In other words, on my own, I don't have time to help someone else. I don't have time to watch someone else's kids. I don't have time to make a sick person a meal. I don't have time to go visit them. Uh, I don't have time to pick up the phone and check on them. I don't have time to send them a text message. I just don't have time. But if the Holy Spirit's in me, guess what? He's going to lead me to find joy in making time. I'm going to arrange my schedule to to meet the need of that person who's struggling financially and and to bring a meal to that person who's hungry and to spend time with that homeless woman who's in need of encouragement and, and to rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep and be Jesus on earth. Again, Jesus is going to heaven. The world's going to hate you, but the Holy Spirit's going to fill you and now you're going to live like Jesus. That's what Jesus did. He fed the hungry. He rejoiced with those who rejoiced. He wept when Lazarus died. He gave comfort and counsel and encouragement. And when people were in sin, He he brought conviction of their sin. The Holy Spirit's going to help us keep His commandments. He's going to help us keep His commandments. Verse 14, right? If you love me, you're going to keep my commandments. You can't. Listen, the gospel is not moralism. It's not do more, try harder. If you're trying to do it on your own, you will fail every time. You want to hear bad preaching? Bad preaching is all you got to do is try harder. All you got to do is do more. Give more money, pray more, and you're going to be happy, healthy, wealthy, and wise. Okay, you might read that in a fortune cookie somewhere, but that's not in the Bible. 
All right? But he is going to, if we are relying on the Holy Spirit all day long, he is going to help us to want to do God's work, to want to do it. It won't be duty. It will be delight. It'll be joy. It'll be joy. And then lastly, he's going to help us to handle and endure the world's hatred and opposition that we talked about all last week. You can't do that on your own. But the Holy Spirit will help you. Let me give you an illustration of this. I read a story back in time before refrigerators, before people had a refrigerator in the house. The kids are like, Pastor, were you there when they had those? Didn't have refrigerators? I wasn't there. All right. There's a few in here that might have been, but I wasn't. All right. And before people had refrigerators in their houses, you had ice boxes, correct? Someone got convicted when I said that. There's someone in here. I saw a few faces. And ice houses would have thick walls and uh, no windows, and they would have a very tightly fitted door. And in winter time, when streams and lakes would freeze over, you listen to the students, large blocks of ice were cut were hauled to the ice houses, and they would cover them with sawdust. And often the ice would last through the winter, even into the summer in these buildings. Pretty amazing. Now, one man who worked in this ice house lost a valuable, he lost a, a watch he had that was really important to him. And he searched diligently for it, going through all this sawdust, trying to find it, raking through it. Uh, it's dark in those rooms, but he couldn't find it anywhere. And his fellow workers also helped him look because they knew how important it was to him to find this watch that was lost. But all of their searching was futile. They couldn't find it. So a small boy who had heard about this search slipped into the ice, ice house. Now, this is why we need you students in our lives, okay? Every time your parents say, help me find something, go help them. They really need you, all right? So the small boy goes into the ice house during the noon hour when all the workers were out. And he soon walked out holding that watch in his hand. Pretty cool. The men were amazed, and they asked him how he found it. And he said, this is what I did. I closed the door, I laid down in the sawdust, and I kept very still and quiet. And pretty soon, I could hear the ticking of the watch. And I could follow the sound, and I found it. I want to say to us today, often we do not hear God the Holy Spirit speak to us because we are not listening well enough. If you always have the radio going, if you always have the news stations going, if you always are busy with activity bustling over, you're never quiet and still, you might be speaking so loud and you might have so much coming into you, you're not hearing the Holy Spirit speak to you. I'm not saying you need to hear an audible voice, but He will guide you, and He will speak to you, and He will direct you, and He will lead you, and He will burden you, and He will help you. Some of us need to be quiet. We need to be still. We need to slow down, and we need to listen. Now, look with me on the screen at this next passage, Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4. Let's talk about this real practically. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths but only as such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. In other words, he's talking about our words and the power of our words. Now notice what he says next. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. If you're not convicted yet, you're about to be. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander, evil speaking, be put away from you with all malice, all hatred. Be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Sounds a lot like John 15. Love one another as I've loved you. We saw two weeks back. All right. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit's a person. He has emotions, intellect, a will. He can be grieved. He can be saddened because he's ignored. He's neglected. He's pushed to the side. We're not sensitive to him. We start to sear our sensitivity. How do we do that? I want you to notice, according to Ephesians 4, our mouth is a big part of that, isn't it? Let no corrupt communication come out of your mouths. What does that mean exactly? Well, the language we use. Are we people of profanity? Are we people of crudeness? 
Do we have church language, the way we talk on Sunday morning, and then the way we talk the rest of the week, Monday through Saturday? Oh, it's just a curse or two. Oh, it's just a joke here or there. Listen, friends, I want you to understand something so important. The Reformers held to a doctrine that we need to recover in the church. It's a Latin phrase, quorum deo. It means to live before the face of God. What does it mean to have corrupt talk? It means if you were standing in the presence of God Almighty, would you use that language? I don't care. There's no such thing as shop talk with God. No such thing. There's no such thing as men talk. Well, that's just the way. No. A real man is a man of integrity who's an example, who is strong and courageous and bold for Christ, not who capitulates to the culture that we live in and sounds like the world around us. Listen, it's not an excuse. Oh, I just, I just said it in that company, but I wouldn't say it in front of a woman. Really? You would say it in front of you wouldn't say it in front of a woman, but you'll say it in front of God Almighty, who you're supposed to be a witness for. Well, God's not here. God the Holy Spirit's with you if you're a Christian. Amen. And you are grieving him. And I would say to us as a church, we need to be so careful in how we communicate. The Bible has so much to say about our mouths. Christians should be the last people called hypocrites for cursing and talking filthy and talking dirty. And, and that's what the scripture's saying here. Christians should be the last people to be bitter and wrathful and anger and snapping at one another. That's what dogs do. We're sheep in a body with a good shepherd. Why are we treating each other that way and talking that way? We should have no tolerance for that in our families. Do you hear that, students? I'm telling your parents right now. I'm saying, parents, no tolerance for that language. If they could talk in front of you like that, they're going to talk to their wife like that or their husband like that one day. They're going to talk to their employer like that one day, and they might not keep their job very long. They might be back, moving back home pretty soon. All right? They're not going to be responsible in life. And ultimately, the way we talk to others represents the way we talk to God. Amen. If you live close to God, you won't talk that way to others. We will give an account, the Scripture says, in multiple places for every idle word we speak. Every idle word. Not some. Every idle word we speak. So if wrath and anger, and, and you, know, you know an angry person when you see one, right? They're angry all the time. They're always clenched, and they've got to always put this facade on of being tough. Let me tell you, an angry person is a weak, hurting person who needs the love of Christ. They need the love of Jesus. What should we do? So if all those things grieve the Holy Spirit of God, what should we do? We should be kind to one another. We shouldn't talk about who we hate. We shouldn't be talking about people behind their backs. We shouldn't be belittling people. We should be kind like Christ is kind to us. Tender-hearted, that means sympathizing with them, forgiving them as God in Christ forgave you. That's what we should be. That's what it means to have the comforter of the Holy Spirit in control. You're comforted, you comfort others. You're loved, you love others. You're forgiven, you forgive others. You've been healed. You help heal others. Your needs have met. You meet the needs of others. That's being controlled by the Holy Spirit. That's the kind of church that this world needs to see. And the world will never be the same if we live like that. We, should, we need to set the bar high. Brothers and sisters, if our church is weak, it's weak because we've set the bar down here. And we should not tolerate these kind of things to one another. What does 1 Thessalonians 5.19 say? Do not quench the Spirit. What a difference it is to wake up in the morning and the Spirit of God is filling your heart and He's giving you patience with your children. He's giving you patience if you're single and you're, you're taking that commute to work thinking about what you're going to have to deal with at work today. He's giving you patience with your health struggles and He's helping you to be able to pray for others and their pain just like you're experiencing. And He's using you to be the hands and feet of Jesus. What an amazing difference that is <coughs> than to wake up bitter, <coughs> to wake up angry, to wake up full of malice and contention. What a difference that would be.
Look how this ends, verse 27. You also will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. Here's the point. You're going to bear witness because the Spirit of God is in you. Let me give you two quotes to close with. I want you to think on these for a minute. First off, from D.L. Moody. Out of 100 men, one will read the Bible and the other 99 will read the Christian. They're reading your Instagram. They're reading your Facebook. But they're also reading your words and your actions and what you do and what you don't do. And whether you're forgiving or not forgiving, whether you're sensitive or you're not sensitive. <coughs> Excuse me. They're reading whether you're a person of forgiveness or whether you're a person of bitterness. They're reading it. And you know what they do when they read those things? When they see your language, when they see how you talk, when you see how you act, they say, if that's what Jesus is, I don't want any of that Jesus. That's not Jesus. That's Antichrist. That's another Jesus. That's not the Jesus of God's Word. I want to be very strong about that today. J.C. Ryle, a Christian is a walking sermon. You think it's a big deal that the pastor preaches a couple times a week? I've preached four times this last week. You think that's a big deal? They preach, you, Christian, preach far more than a minister does because your life preaches all week long. All week long, you're either testifying of Jesus or against Jesus. For Jesus as a follower or against Jesus as a foe. Your life is a witness. Do people see bitter, anger, unforgiving, wrathful, worldly people? Or do they see loving, truthful, holy, gracious, merciful people? We are not saved to run from the world. We are saved to run to the world and reach the world by the power of the Holy Spirit. A young missionary named Herbert Jackson was given a car to help him in his missionary work. And so... The car was a, a major asset, but it had one difficulty. This car would not start without a push or a jump start. Some of us in our past have had cars like that, okay? I had a car that I had to, you know, get the metal rod out and hit the starter to get it going, okay? Well, this guy, this missionary's car, it would not start without a push or a jump start. So this missionary, Herbert Jackson, devised a system to deal with the car's inability to start. When he was ready to leave his home, he went to a nearby school and he asked permission to bring some of the children out of the class to help start his car. And then throughout the day, he was always call, careful to park on a hill or leave his engine running when he stopped for short visits. So for two years, this young missionary thought he was so ingenious using this method to, to get his car from point A to point B. Now, <clears throat> poor health hit him and his family, and eventually he had to leave the mission field. And a new missionary came onto the scene. And as he was introducing himself, uh, Dr. Jackson began to show this new missionary how he started the car every day and his tricks to get it going. And the young man, the new missionary, went under the hood and he began to inspect it. And he said, Dr. Jackson, I believe the only trouble is this cable right here. He went ahead. He gave the cable a couple twists. He pushed the switch, and the engine roared to life. Why do I tell you that story? For two years, Dr. Jackson had used all of his strength and devices and endured all kinds of needless trouble. When the power to start the car was there all the time, it only needed to be connected. And I want to say to you, the power is there. The Holy Spirit's with you if you're a Christian. You need to be filled by Him. You need to be controlled by Him. You need to surrender to Him. So let's bow our heads and our hearts before the Lord in prayer.